Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a podcast host as your realtor? No, of course you haven't. That would be insane. Hey, it's Kona here to tell you that we can make that insanity happen because I actually am a realtor based in Northern Virginia. So if you happen to live in the area, I can help you directly, but I can also help anyone around the world achieve your real estate goals because I have an amazing referral network that I work with and I help people everywhere. I also offer special incentives to veterans, to active military members, to AARP members, and so many more people. So if you are interested in buying, selling, renting, whatever it may be, all you need to do is go to my website, callcona.com, and we can connect. And I promise I will also give you all of the tea and all of the background info on this podcast if you want to. So again, that's callcona.com if you need real estate. So let's get back to the episode. A man has a disagreement with a significant other. They've been involved for years and have had three children together, but their relationship has always been rocky. But this night, April 13th, 2020 is different. Ralph Riz Jean-Marie was allegedly so upset that he took off at around 1 a.m., leaving everything behind in his Barry Vermont motel room, his glasses, his wallet with ID, and his medication. He wasn't reported missing until nearly three days later. Now, it's been over a year since anyone has seen Ralph, and rumors are flying around the small town. His case has caught the attention of Black Lives Matter activists who are turning a critical eye toward the Barry City Police and their investigation. They're asking the question, have they been doing everything they can to find answers in this case? Or have they put in less effort because Ralph is a transient and a black man? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Ralph Riz Jean Marie. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone. Now, before we dig into this case, I want to quickly mention that we have a new bonus mini-sode up on our Patreon. If you listen to our Angela Hammond episode from season one, there has been a huge update. It's available to all of our $5 and up subscribers. So if you're interested, be sure to check it out. Patreon.com slash pod. We'd also like to give a huge shout out to our newest Patreon member, Nicole S. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. But now let's move on to Ralph. And this, I have to say, is I hope like everybody's been sick of these two part episodes, but this is going to be another one. This is 2020? Yeah, this just happened so this is, this like 13 very, months ago. Very recent. Yeah, and that's part of the thing. Like, it's so recent. So there's still like a lot of interest. A lot of information in the case, going. A lot of out. information. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's a lot still happening. Like, there was breaking news today um, as we're recording this. And so, like, even when I thought I was finished writing it, I, I, I kept on going. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I don't think there's like any way we're going to get all this into one episode. I mean, not unless people want to listen to us for two hours straight, but yeah. I can't imagine anybody would no. want to listen to us. <laughs> this case is just really frustrating. Um, I mean, they all are, but gosh, you know, with this being so recent and all of the craziness that's surrounding it, it's just, I don't know, like I, I really got angry while I was writing this. So anyway, all right, Ralph, I couldn't find much information about his early life, even the Charlie project, which is usually where I can find the basic kind of biographical information Mm -hmm. doesn't have even his date of birth. He was 38 um, when he disappeared last year. And I've gathered from different articles about his case that he wasn't 
necessarily estranged from his family, but he wasn't exactly close to them either. Ralph had been living sort of a transient lifestyle, and from what I've gathered, family didn't always know exactly where he was staying. So, like, they always had a general idea. Like, they knew he was in Vermont. He knew he was around Barry. But, I mean, they didn't necessarily know what apartment he was in or who he was living with, things sure. like that. yeah. And he also didn't always have a cell phone, so he didn't always have easy ways to get in touch with people. Okay. Uh, 38, so he's mm-hmm. a couple years younger than us. Yeah. So that, that's interesting. Um, like, I, I, I don't feel like we've covered many cases where transients were around our age. Hmm. I mean, transient. Yeah. I mean, what does that even mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, like does transient mean that they just like rebuff the, the, the normal. It wasn't so much lifestyle that I just not connected to the internet or whatever. Well, I mean, (laughs) or was he, it's certainly not about the internet. No. In the sense that like he was, like, didn't, he was homeless. Well, maybe slightly at times okay. he was homeless, but it certainly isn't rebuffing social media. There's a lot of Facebook drama in this case. Oh, okay. So that certainly was not part of it. Okay. Um, but no, it was really just like relationship problems, you know, living with someone, not living with somebody, couch surfing, trying to, you know, staying at a motel, like that kind of stuff. Okay. I mean, I get a, I get a different connotation when you say transient. Mm. Um, I get like homeless essentially. Yeah. And at times Um, he, he certainly was experiencing homelessness. The thought of him having like somewhat of a support network where he could couch surf or occasionally he landed himself in apartments. Yeah. And the, the issue, though, to talk about with his support system is that while he had friends in Barrie, his family was back in Massachusetts. So he didn't have that close support system where he was. And that really does play into this whole story. Okay. So I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'll stop and let you continue. Then. Yeah. So Ralph was originally from Brockton, Massachusetts. His cousin Fabiola Williams still lives there, as do his two oldest children. Fabiola remembers Ralph as being soft spoken and big hearted. His family understands that he has battled with drug use problems, but insists that his issues don't take away from the fact that he's a good person who is missed by many people. Drug use has nothing to do with your personality. No. You could be an asshole and use drugs. You could be the nicest guy in the world and use drugs. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody loves Matthew Perry, (laughs) right? He had a drug use problem. (laughs) Yeah. Absolutely. I, and, I mean, that, that has it has nothing to do with your personality. It, it's, it comes down to, you know, addiction. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, this is going off on a little bit of a tangent, but um, I was reading an article really kind of tangentially related to this case, not about uh, Ralph, about somebody who died of a drug overdose and his mom wrote in the comments something to the effect of nobody says that they want to be an addict when they grow up. It's yeah. just, you know, it, it happens. happens. It can happen. Right. Like I was kind of saying before about this case, because it's so recent, there's a lot of stuff on social media from people involved, both directly and tangentially, and a lot of accusations being thrown around. In fact, you will straight up see people online who are like, these people killed him and name names and like, you know, be very blunt about it. Jesus. And yeah, and say like, why aren't the police doing anything? And On one hand, believing that certain people are guilty of a crime isn't enough to make arrests or, and more importantly, get convictions. Right. But on the other hand, there are some shocking gaps in this investigation. Okay, let's get into it. Yeah, so I'll try to get through this as chronologically as possible, but it's a little tough. So like I said, Ralph was born in Massachusetts and had two children with a woman there. His oldest son is now 16. At some point within the last six or eight years, maybe even 10, it's the whole, that part of the whole timeline is kind of hard to tell. He met and started dating a woman named Bridget Huckins. I'm not sure if Ralph's drug use started before he met Bridget or after, but it is something that plagued the couple throughout the relationship. But Bridget definitely started young. 
I found an article on Vermont Today from 2012 in which an 18-year-old Bridget Huckins was arrested with two other teenagers for multiple burglaries. Ralph wasn't mentioned in this arrest, and it's unclear whether or not they knew each other at this point, but they most certainly knew each other and were together two years later when Bridget was arrested again, this time for a more violent crime. According to an article from that enterprise dated May 3rd, 2014, quote, in a fit of rage, end quote, Bridget Huckins, who was by then 20, assaulted her boyfriend and acquaintance and the acquaintance's dog. Was Ralph the boyfriend? Yes. So the boyfriend in question was not named in that article, but then later information did come out that it was him. So basically what it seems like happened was she and Ralph were fighting and it got so bad that this acquaintance kind of tried to intervene and break it up, at which point Bridget stabbed her twice in the face with what the acquaintance, (laughs) yes, the acquaintance with what the police characterized as a quote, small pointed metal object, end quote. I'm guessing not a knife because I feel like I hope they would have just said knife, but maybe like a like a metal nail file or something. Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what else you would describe as a small pointed metal object. Yeah, I have no idea. A nail, but they would describe that as a nail. Yeah, she then stabbed the dog in the neck. Why? I don't why, know. why the dog? I don't know. Like maybe be, when she was like attacking the woman, the, the dog, dog was her. like, hey, what the hell? And yeah, maybe the dog went after her, which good for the dog. But like, yeah, so the dog got stabbed in the neck. The lady got stabbed in the face. Jesus. And the assault was bad enough that all three of the people went to the hospital. Ralph and the other woman for their injuries sustained during the fight. And then Bridget, because she was having trouble breathing okay but what happened to the dog okay so the dog <laughs> i want to make sure the dog is okay no and the, the article scenario. the article did like tell so the the owner of the dog did not like apparently yes the dog got stabbed in the neck but like it wasn't bad and so okay All the right. dog didn't go to the veteran so the dog was fine the dog was fine okay Bridget was charged with assault and battery assault and battery with a dangerous weapon and animal cruelty So, yeah, it wasn't exactly a stable relationship. Clearly. Yeah, because this is all the way back in 2014. Okay. So we're talking years ago, six years before Before anything. Before he disappeared. Yeah. Right. The assault took place in Massachusetts, so it was sometime after this that the couple moved to Vermont. But the change of scenery didn't really seem to help. On a snowy day in January of 2017, Bridget was driving around and nearly hit a police cruiser. At this point, the officer noticed that the car didn't have a front license plate, which is required in Vermont. So Officer Tucker, the driver of the police car in question, was like, all right, well, I'm going to pull this person over reasonably. Sure. So she started to pursue Bridget and called in the tag number on the rear license plate. But dispatch informed her that it wasn't a real license plate number. Ah. Yeah. It didn't match any vehicle. So meanwhile, Bridget is not pulling over. She ends up leading Officer Tucker on a two-mile chase through snowy streets. The chase finally ended when other units laid out spike strips. Oh, wow. Even in the snow? I guess, yeah. Wow. I mean, I don't know how things are handled up in New England (laughs) when it snows all the time. I guess 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 everybody's used to it. They're like, screw it. Yeah, like high-speed pursuit. You know, high speed pursuits like happen in the middle of a snowstorm and you just handle them like normal and I guess throw it on spike strips and it's like all normal. Yeah, like, and they <laughs> could still have to go to school. <laughs> so once the tires are spiked, Bridget finally stops and Officer Tucker goes over to say, like, hey, <laughs> and see what's going on. Bridget apparently told her that she didn't pull over because she was on her way to the methadone clinic and didn't want to be late. To get her methadone? Well, listen, punctuality is important. (laughs) She had three passengers in her car who all told the officer they were terrified during the chase. Like, none of them wanted to be in that car. Like, none of them wanted to have anything to do with this. And one of those passengers was Ralph. Ralph, yeah. 
I need you. I need, I'm going to need your help with this next part. After she was pulled over, Bridget gave the officer consent to search her vehicle. Okay. Why? Like, why would you do that? I I don't know. That <laughs> that has literally been a question that I've asked in my trainings in law enforcement. People give consent yeah. to, to cops to search all the time. Why? I, I've never had a, a police officer ask to search my vehicle, I, but like, why? Like, what's the upside of that? What's the best case scenario? I mean, I guess the best nothing. case scenario is like, there's nothing in your car and whatever you all well, move sure, on but with your lives. But still, like, why? 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 <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I agree 100. percent That like, I can tell you stories of officers that I work with where they like asked for consent to search a bag, and then found scales and weed and baggies, and mm-hmm. the officer was like, "What the hell? If you knew, <laughs> if you knew you had this in here." Why did you, why, why did you, why did you let me search? Oh, and this actually brings me to my favorite thing that I've ever learned from you, which is so like self-evident if you think about it, but a lot of people don't think about it, which is that if a police officer ever asks you for something, that means you that don't have don't to do have it. Con- yeah. They <laughs> don't have a reason, a, reason a legal basis, search. right? Yes. Yeah. But you can always ask. Right. Exactly. And if you say yes, <laughs> That's it. Yeah. So don't ever say yes. Don't ever say yes. I, sorry, fellow law enforcement officers, but like, I, yeah. that's, that's like the biggest secret in law enforcement is like, <laughs> we can ask. And if you give us permission, we're gonna. Yeah. But you don't have to. Right. So Officer Tucker had consent. Yes. According to her affidavit. And this is what the search turned up. Several syringes, Uh including one with blood on it. She searched Bridget's purse. Now, okay, question. So if the purse is in the car, do you need separate consent to search the purse? Or is that blanket with consenting to search the vehicle? Uh, That would be kind of difficult. It depends on where it is in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. It depends on who's purse it is and how you can attribute it to being that person's purse. And that's all stuff that can be sussed out with the DA. But like, as far as charges bring being brought based on what you find in that purse, it would get a little gray. Okay. In her purse, she found a spoon with a white substance on it. Bridget reportedly admitted that the substance was crack cocaine. Okay, well, <laughs> so I mean, if she's did yeah. she al- did she also admit that, that that was her purse? I would assume so. I mean, yeah. I think she was the only woman in the car. I'm not positive to uh, that though. That's still, but yeah, no, yeah. I know, I know, but yeah. So I mean, given the fact that she's admitting to like everything, it would not shock me if she was like, "Yes, this is my purse." Yeah. So I mean, obviously, if you admit, admit that's your purse, then yeah. everything inside belongs to you, right? Regardless of whether you actually put it there, or unless not. you're Lindsay Lohan, and she's like, "These aren't my pants." Do you remember that when the cops found cocaine in her pant pocket? So funny story. My father literally had this, the exact same thing happen to him. He had cocaine in his pants. No. David flick. Uh, <laughs> other way around. How scandalous. So, so he was a parole officer and, uh, he searched a parolee and found some drug in a pocket. And mm-hmm. that was literally the excuse that the parolee used. He was like, Oh, those aren't my pants. He's like, okay, well, like, <laughs> this was also back in like the very early 80s. So yeah. it comes down to constructive possession. Mm-hmm. If it's on your person, it's yours. Same thing with bags or whatever. Mm-hmm. If they are your bag, then whatever is in your bag is yours. So that's right. the same concept. So if she admitted that that was her purse, then everything in that, regardless of whether she actually put anything in that purse or not, uh, is hers. Because mm-hmm. it's constructive possession. Yeah. Well, it didn't work for Lindsay Lohan either. Well, yeah, it shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so the officer then searched the trunk and found another spoon with a yellowish substance on it. Mm. And Heroin? No. Bridget said that that substance was Ritalin. Oh, interesting. Yeah. She also reportedly told the officer that one of the reasons she didn't pull over was because she thought she had a warrant out for her in Massachusetts 
from that 2014 assault. Okay, so the the justification behind any of this is I'm just going to continue to run away from the cops. Like that that never works. <laughs> Well, especially because it was snowy and the officer's like, yeah, she kept on sliding into yeah, like the was, other lane. She was also probably only going like 30 miles an right. hour. Yeah, I don't think snowy, this was a high so speed like, chase. Because I feel like it was also in a residential area too. Yeah, so like what was her end game? I have no idea. I don't, I mean, listen, I don't know what her end game was with that. I don't know what her end game was with just admitting to all of this stuff and right? letting the cops search. Like, yeah. Yeah, the whole end game part of this is completely baffling to me. Also, again, with the search, if a police officer asks you to search the car, you absolutely say no. And you also understand that they have zero right to go into any locked compartments within the car. Yeah, um, everybody knows that because of Jay-Z. Have a, well, thank you. The glove compartment's locked, so there's the trunk in the back. I know, yeah. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, 99 problems, right? I know. I, I heard the song too. But spell it out. Mm -hmm. If a cop asks for consent to search your vehicle or your bag, that probably means they can't actually search. So say no, and then it comes down to just what is in their visible area. Right. Because if they see something out, so like... Then that's so, different. Right. So if the cop had stopped Bridget... And the spoon with the white substance was out in the console, for instance, in clear view. Then the cop could say, hey, what's that? And then kind of go from there. Correct. And then, but they still cannot search locked compartments without right. consent. No, yeah. I'm, or I'm talking warrant. solely about. Yes. Then, then, it, then it comes down to what's in cursor review. Right. So, yes, they can pull you out of the vehicle, question you for further investigation and then search the immediate area where you were. Mm -hmm. But they still cannot search. So if they see something on the console, they could search like the front seat yeah. area. Yeah. Front seat area, probably back seat area, anywhere yeah. that you could possibly reach where you could stash something. Right. Yes. Okay. But they cannot, again, they cannot search glove boxes, center console. If it's, if it locks mm -hmm. or the trunk without probable cause. Right. So these are warrant. basically, these are all life tips. So like, I hope everybody is taking notes. Yeah, go for it. So anyway, so Bridget says she didn't want to stop. One of her reasons was because <laughs> she thought she had a warrant out on her. And Bridget was correct. There was a warrant out for her in Massachusetts from that 2014 incident. So I'm just going to run away on a 30 mile an hour yeah. road covered with snow. Yes. All right, go. Plus, she had also racked up a misdemeanor conviction for simple assault in 2015 and another misdemeanor conviction for retail theft in November of that same year. Now, the article didn't say who she was convicted of assaulting, so I can't definitively say she has a pattern of domestic violence okay. against Ralph. Yeah. But she does certainly have a pattern of reckless and violent behavior. Sure. And the kicker to all of this, when all of these people, you know, were pulled over and Officer Tucker was talking to all of them. She was talking to Ralph and Ralph said, oh yeah, Bridget's six months pregnant. Oh, oh damn. Mm-hmm. Okay. This incident led to convictions for felony gross negligent operation while eluding law enforcement and misdemeanor reckless endangerment. She was sentenced to up to a year, but it was suspended and she was put on probation for two years. But she regularly failed to show up to her probation meetings, so she was arrested again in March of 2018 and released on a $500 unsecured appearance bond. Okay. So basically, it just seems like she has a long series of arrests that end in slaps on the wrist. So I'm not familiar with Vermont's diversion tactics, but I feel like at, at this point with multiple arrests and convictions like at some point there a judge should be at least offering some sort of diversion tactic where it's like a, a rehab facility mm -hmm. or a halfway house or something if these charges are are misdemeanors and they're not to the point where they want to actually put her in jail right you know yeah so i wonder though if maybe that did happen at some point like, because if the story she gave Officer Tucker was true, that she was on her way to a methadone clinic, that could be related 
to some sort of treatment, to some sort of drug court type thing, to something? Maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm just not familiar enough to say that that Vermont or Massachusetts would include a methadone clinic in mm-hmm. treatment. Yeah, and I, I don't know either. So, yeah, so we're not sure about that. But what we are sure of is that the problems in Ralph and Bridget's lives continued. By the next year, Bridget had given birth to two children. Though there was apparently infidelity, she told Ralph that they were his. But by February of 2019, and I do uh, like I do apologize for this because I try to narrow down the timeline as much as possible with the births of these children, but it was kind of hard. I just had to infer things and read between the lines. But by February of 2019, when she was pregnant with her third child, Ralph seemed to doubt paternity, telling his sister that Bridget had cheated on him back in November. November of 2018 was an especially tumultuous month, according to what Ralph told his sister. He said that on November 19th of 2018, DCFS received multiple complaints about domestics and child abuse, so they took custody of the couple's children. DCFS? The Department of Children and Family Services. In Vermont? Yes. Okay. Bridget even ended up taking out a no-contact order on Ralph. So then Bridget moved into an apartment while Ralph was staying at the Pierre Hotel in Barrie. And again, this timeline is hard to decipher, but at some points in this whole situation, the third baby was born. But by February 2019, Ralph told his sister that DCFS had all three children. So he said three children and had placed them with Bridget's father, I believe, temporarily. What is anybody doing for a job at this point? That is never mentioned in any article that I ever read. So you said Ralph was staying at a hotel Mm -hmm. and Bridget has an apartment. Mm -hmm. So they obviously have some sort of income. Well, so we will get to this a little bit later, but at, I do know at some point there were like Section 8 vouchers involved. Okay, but that doesn't count the hotel, though. Well, it it could. Can it? And yeah, and so we'll we'll get to all that. But, okay. um, but no, in terms of jobs, like I could not find any employment information on either one of them throughout this entire thing. Okay. Things kept on going downhill for Ralph. And by March of 2019, he was broke and without a place to live. On March 12th, he told his sister Barbara via Facebook Messenger, quote, I'm broke, big sister. I slept outside under a bridge last night. I have no more money. Please, Barbara, will you help me? I'm hungry as fuck. I don't want to sleep outside again. Sorry for asking. I just don't know what to do, end quote. So I don't know what she replied because I only have one side of the conversation, but it doesn't sound like Ralph ever left Barry. Sometime between that message and May 24th, so about two months later, the couple did get back together and he was living with Bridget in her apartment. But it seems like that may not have been allowed due to their various legal complications. I mean, it sounds like it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because he said in another message to his sister, which read in part, quote, I don't want to end up in jail because how Bridget got me living in her apartment, end quote. Yeah. Yeah. Then he said that, quote, I don't think she loved me anymore. I'm just here, I feel, as a personal ATM. He ended it with, let me move in, Barbie, please, end quote. So this was May of 2019, and I couldn't find out much about what happened with the couple over the next year. It does seem like they did not regain custody of their three children. It also seems that their cohabitation in that apartment did end at some point, because by April of 2020, Ralph was staying at the Hollow Inn in Barrie. And now this answers your previous question. This hotel not only had standard rooms that you could rent by the night or presumably the week, but it also took state vouchers for people experiencing homelessness. Oh, okay. So there were more long-term residents as well, which is basically the same setup as the Cecil Hotel had in the Elisa Lam case. Yes, Remember that documentary? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, where it was like half like tourists and then half uh, people with vouchers. Right. Yeah, not not so permanent residents. But yeah, long-term yeah. residents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. Yeah, okay. so it's the same type of setup as okay. that. 
So I don't know if the Pierre Hotel was that same kind of deal where he was staying before or if he was just renting that room as normal. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Now, this next part is unconfirmed as it seems to be based on the town's rumor mill. But on the night of April 13th, and, and the part that's unconfirmed are the people in the room because I couldn't find any official confirmation of all of these people other than Bridget. On the night of April 13th, 2020, Ralph was apparently in a motel room with Bridget and a man named Chris Elmer, who is a local drug dealer, and another man named Chris Dunn, who is a maintenance man at the motel. The story that eventually made its way to police was that sometime around 1 a.m., Ralph and Bridget got into an argument and Ralph stormed off. Now, at the time, he was wearing gray pajama pants, a gray Carhartt jacket, and tennis shoes and a hat. He left behind his medications, wallet, ID, and glasses. What medications did he leave behind? Is that listed anywhere? Yeah. So, the, actually, interestingly, the only place I ever found it mentioned was the Charlie Project. And um, he had sickle cell anemia and was on medication for that. We've talked about medications before mm -hmm. being uh, an issue, but more so in this case, sickle cell anemia, that type of medication is not something that's like you go to a doctor or you call a doctor and you're like, hey, I lost my prescription. Can you just like refill this? Mm -hmm. Like that involves testing, that involves blood work. That's like, that's like a bigger deal. Than like the the heart, uh, the blood pressure the medication. blood pressure medication, right. That yeah. we've had in other cases. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Also, and also sickle cell anemia, like if you don't take your medication, you die. Yeah, and I, I don't know like what severity he had. That's true. Or I, yeah, That's true. I don't know you, about you any correct. of that. What I do know is that, so he left his glasses behind and apparently without his glasses, he was legally blind. Okay, so this does not sound like somebody that was like departing to start a new life somewhere. No, no, no. Like, this was definitely like he stormed out last minute. Mm -hmm. Also sounds very comfortable. I would, I would like to wear pajama pants and, a and like a, yeah, car hunt jack. Yeah. It sounds I mean, great. Like, yeah. That sounds, that well, sounds but, really comfortable. But honestly, so that is part of why, like on its face, you can see why this maybe isn't insanely suspicious, right? Because it was April. He was dressed properly for the weather sure, and comfortably, yeah. like yeah. you said, right? And he was walking away to cool off after an argument. Like, that's a fairly normal thing to do. Yeah, and we have a history uh, of, of him getting involved with arguments but not being the aggressor. Right, either. right. There, there's a history of him not being arrested on, on DVs, mm -hmm. but being a subject of domestic violence. Yeah, and the only thing, the closest that... I found was that no contact order that she put out. Right. But I, in everything that I read, could never find anything about him getting arrested. Right. And not to say that it's outside of the realm of possibilities no, yeah. of, of that escalating to that point. Oh, for sure. But there's no history of that. So he's, he's walking away to cool off. Yeah. Like you said. Right. And like, and again, even though he was apparently legally blind without his glasses, I can still see him leaving those behind if he's angry enough. Sure. You know, so if we're solely looking at the facts of this disappearance, I can 100% believe that he did leave on his own accord, right? Yeah. Except for the fact that he didn't return. Okay. And so, okay, maybe he didn't want to go back. Maybe he didn't want to see Bridget again, even if all of his stuff was in that room. But he didn't reach out to anyone else either. What time of day did he leave? 1 a.m. Okay. And to me, if it's 1 a.m. and you leave, you're going to call a friend or a family member or even walk over to someone's house or something like that. But, you know, let's say you're just, you're so polite and you don't want to put anyone out because it's 1 a.m. The very least, you, I feel like you would reach out the next day. But no one has heard from Ralph since that night. You said it's 1, 1.30 in the morning? 1 in the morning, around then. Okay, so it's 1 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Streets of Vermont. Small town. Small town in Vermont. It's April, but it's Vermont, so there's there may still be snow on the ground, whatever. My initial reaction is that, that somebody hit him. He's walking on, on the side of a road, right? Mm -hmm. I mean... 
potentially. I don't know. I mean, no, because this was a residential area. It was? It was, okay. yeah. So there were um, single-family homes across the street from the hotel. Okay, so there's sidewalks? I would assume, yeah. Maybe? Yeah, no. So it's not like this was like a, a, a hotel off the exit you know, of the highway or anything like that. Okay. Like presumably okay. he's in a residential area with sidewalks and places that he could have okay. safely that, walked. That, that paints a different picture. Right. Because my initial reaction was he's walking down the side of a, a busy street uh -huh. and, you know, got hit by a car because it's one in the morning. Right. So, but okay. So let's continue. The thing that immediately makes this suspicious is the fact that he didn't reach out to anybody. Right. You know, I just don't think that there's a world in which anything not terrible could have happened after he left that hotel because he just didn't reach out to anybody and he had nothing with him. Yeah. I mean, you don't, I mean, we've, we've gone over this in previous cases. Like you don't, you don't just bail and leave the things that you need to function on a daily basis. Right. Like if, if you, if you need your glasses to see, hey, trust me, I wear glasses mm -hmm. and I'm very far from legally blind, but I spend half a day without my glasses and I get annoyed as shit. Yeah. So there's no way if I'm if I'm planning on just like strolling out, starting a new life or whatever, I'm taking my glasses with me. Or even if you're not planning that in the moment and you make that decision later, like you make you, plans to get that stuff. Yes, right. You know, like you call a friend to go pick it up if you don't want to see your you know, girlfriend or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And the medication again. Yeah. I, I just, I know I, I, I harped on it in the previous case with Hoagie about his, his blood pressure, uh, blood yeah. pressure medication, but like sickle cell anemia is so much more dangerous than heart, than heart problems. I know that sounds stupid to say that blood pressure. Yeah. But like sickle cell anemia is not something you want to mess with because that can lead to all kinds of other medical issues. Right. And so to, you know, the investigator's credit, I will say that him starting a new life was never really on the table. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> good. <laughs> I, I, I am so tired of hearing of cops I know, like I know. showing up and being like, nah, he's gone. Yeah. He just, he's got a wife somewhere. Yeah. Like I'm sure you don't it's fine. Don't worry it. about so, it. Yeah. I don't want to waste my time with this. Yeah. Good. Okay. So that's off the table. It is. Let's it was never really on, on the that. table. Um, Good. the only thing non foul play related that was on the table is suicide. So, you know, police did bring that up as a possibility, obviously, which again, it, he's upset, it's a possibility. had a fight, sure. you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, no evidence of, of that in his past, though. No, none. His family. Not that we know of. Well, no. And his family was adamant that he's never had depressive episodes. Like he's never, ever given any sign that that's something that he would consider. And again, it can sneak up on you. Sometimes it happens and there is no sign. But you know, that in, in even with police, like police didn't really seem to, to go down that path too far, you no, know, but they left it open as sure. a possibility. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay. So going back to like the people who are there now, I do get why Bridget wouldn't immediately freak out and call the police. So there, you know, her and Ralph's relationship had been tumultuous and it would be pretty reasonable to think that he wanted some space. But a day goes by, he's still gone, she doesn't call police. Then two days, and then three. And and the kids are still in... DCFS uh, custody, yeah, or okay. with her father or something. They, they do not have custody of okay, their children. Okay. 68 hours pass between the time that Ralph was allegedly last seen and when he's finally reported missing. And it wasn't even Bridget who reports them. It was another friend. Was it one of the people in the room? I do not believe so because um, from what it sounds like, those people were not Ralph's friends. Ah. They were Bridget's. Okay. Were any of the people in the room questioned by police? Yes. So police did say that they did question the people who were in the room that night. Okay. Now, what I do not know and why I kind of give that that disclaimer at the beginning was that the the names of the people other than Bridget, I have not seen confirmed anywhere okay. by police. 
Sure, but to be fair, it is a it is still a relatively this is 2020. Oh yeah. Like it's a n- relatively new investigation. Mm-hmm. So th- any information that that they have, they're going to keep close to the vest. Right, at right, this right. Point, because they don't know what they're investigating. Yes, it's a missing person, but you know, w- assuming the worst, it's a homicide. Mm-hmm. So they have to keep potential suspects close. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. At, at least at this point. Yeah. You know, if it goes cold and we're talking three, four, five years from now, then we're talking about, okay, well, maybe we need to branch out publicly to get more information. Oh, honey, you're getting okay. ahead of yourself. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they, of course, interviewed Bridget. I mean, first and foremost, right? Absolutely. Like she's obviously yes. got to be the first person on their list. I mean, there's a history there. Yeah. And she was you know, with him and it's his significant other. And so that's when she tells them that whole 1 a.m. leaving after a fight story. Okay. But police aren't necessarily buying it. According to the website VT Digger, the items that Ralph left behind made police suspect foul play pretty early on. Sure. Yeah. Though it also sounds like they didn't really want to believe that. Like... I don't know. This is so confusing. I I have a lot of quotes in this from law enforcement and a lot of them are just kind of baffling. So, all right. So Tim Bombardier, who was the Barry public safety director at the time, and he's later described as the chief of police. So I don't know, but in any case, Bombardier comes up a lot in this. Wait, okay. His last name is Bombardier. Yeah. Which is awesome. Like I gotta say, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like I don't, I don't. I'm not a fan of this guy. Spoiler, but uh, no, his last name is no completely wrong, amazing. It, yes, but wrong career. Like going to the air force. <laughs> Just, I, it doesn't even matter if you're never on a plane, but like if your last name is Bombardier, like you should definitely go to the air force. Yeah, no, it's it's great. So he said, "quote." If you go back historically and look at missing persons that have turned into homicide cases, there's not a bunch of them, end quote. The fuck does that mean? I don't know. Like, okay. Why? So that what? article where he's- like, Why would you look at statistics of, of missing persons and, and, and- And I think he was referring like specifically to local missing persons cases, not like nationwide statistics or whatever. But like, I still don't see the point. And so this article where I read that quote was from June 25th, 2020. So over two months after Ralph's disappearance. Okay. But that all, but that, that's already showing, I don't, I don't want to say prejudice, but close mindedness yes. on, on the case. Yes. Like who, who the fuck cares what the statistics are about missing persons turning into homicides you don't you don't know what you have at this point. Right. Because they didn't have anything at right. that point and it's 2 months gone already. So you investigate it as an investigation and whether it becomes a missing persons case or a homicide investigation, you don't know at that point. You investigate as an open investigation. That to me already says that that their the outlook is skewing one way or another. Right, it's like it's a total red flag. To me. Uh, Yeah, that's a huge red flag to me. Maybe we're both misinterpreting this, but to me, I... You you are correct. (laughs) Maybe this quote was taken out of context. We don't know. Yeah. But it it said to me, like, yes, it's foul play, but this doesn't really happen all that often. So that's why it seems like we haven't been putting a ton of effort into this case. Like, I mean, like, it just sounds like he's like, oh, yeah, no, we're playing the odds. I don't know. Because he said in... Like, out of one side of his mouth, he's like, yeah, it's foul play. And then on the other, like, statistically, missing persons cases don't turn into homicide. So maybe he's, like, trying to say it was a suicide at that point. Like, I don't know. I don't know what he was trying to do. Or was he trying to say that they were investigating it primarily as a homicide and less of a missing persons? But it doesn't fucking matter. Like, at at this point in the investigation, whether he's missing or dead... It doesn't matter how you're investigating it. It's still an open investigation as to what happened. Like, I'm assuming they don't have 
a large police force where they have separate investigators for missing persons right. versus homicides. Right. So I'm assuming that it's probably just they have an investigations unit. Mm-hmm. So it would be the same people investigating regardless of whether it was missing person or homicide. Yeah, I don't know. Like, and, and this is all presumptuous, sure, but more often than not, unless you're in a major city, even the major crimes unit in major cities, the, the only separation in, in investigations is narcotics versus homicide. So then you're talking about all the other like investigations, quote unquote, and more often than not, those tend to lean towards the homicide detectives, but they won't pick it up as a homicide. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I think so. Narcotics is totally different. Right. That's so, a totally different animal. Yeah, so if they think that something bad has happened, it's going yes. to be the homicide detectives who who are investigating it, whether or not they actually think it's a homicide. So they're trying to figure right. out whether it is a homicide. Right, so if right? it's missing a person or a homicide... What the fuck difference does it make? Why would you quote that? Why would you say that? Listen. It's I'm, the same investigators searching for the same outcome. Yeah. Finding the guy. Yes. Where is he? Where is Ralph? Right. Whether he's alive or dead, the investigation is leading to the same outcome. Where is he? Right? Yeah. Right. And so at this point is when we start to hear rumblings of like, hey, it doesn't really seem like police are taking this super seriously. Though Bombardier is quick to point out that a police bulletin went out to the public within 48 hours of Ralph being reported missing, Many critics, including Vermont's Black Lives Matter groups, have decried what they see as the lack of attention given to this case. They think that not only did the Barry police not devote the resources needed to solve this, but that the media has also been apathetic. Mm. And there are strong arguments for both. The first news article about Ralph's disappearance didn't show up until June 17th, 2020. He, he went missing in April. So we're talking, right. yeah, two months. And that was the article that I was referencing was in June. And most of the articles that I was able to find from around that time just gave the basic facts of the case. Like a man had a fight with a significant other, walked away at 1 a.m. He was wearing X, Y, and Z. Hasn't been seen. There is no in-depth reporting to any of it. This happens all the time across the country when, you know, victims who aren't media friendly go missing. We, they just don't get the media coverage. They don't get the police resources. This happens. And then they kind of, the cases fade away Mm. and that very well could have happened with this, except Ralph disappeared just about a month before George Floyd's murder and the subsequent protests across the country. Ah. It really seems like this was a rallying point for the black community in the overwhelmingly white Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> you could just categorize that as New England in general. Well, sure. exactly, yeah. right? So a black man was missing and probably murdered. Probably. And authorities didn't seem to care. And so people started demanding justice and they got loud. Uh, Yeah. And so I really do think that the time and the place of Ralph's disappearance is probably the only reason why I've heard of this case, probably the only reason why I'm able to bring you this story today, because Mm -hmm. it just would have faded away like so many others. But this story really did start to gain steam. In just last month, around the one-year anniversary of Ralph's disappearance, a new documentary about Ralph was announced. Filmmakers Tiana Langevin and Anthony Marques are working on a four-part documentary called Silent City. Langevin told WCAX, quote, The further we can get this story to reach, the more eyes and ears we can get on it. I don't know the man. I know the man as a statistic, but I don't know him as a human. So through this documentary, we want to show him as a human and not just another statistic, end quote. We're going to 
embed the videos on the blog, but there are a few kind of teaser videos on YouTube for this and it looks amazing. Like very well done. It has um, Ralph's family in it. A lot of really good interviews. It has some of his friends from Barry. It looks, I'm very excited about this. Good, good. I, I think that we're part of the, the true crime society now. Mm-hmm. And part of our whole thing is, is getting, getting the word out to society at large about ours is about missing persons, but like any social media, any, any type of media attention that can be drawn to somebody, uh, you know, to these cases, I I think is, is phenomenal. More power to them. Yeah, absolutely. As 2020 went on, nothing much seemed to develop in Ralph's case. In September of that year, a criminal inquest was launched and multiple subpoenas were issued. The month before, police did state publicly that they believe foul play was involved and that they thought there were people who knew more than what they were saying, but then that was kind of it. Okay. (laughs) I mean, okay. Well, any time you, as a law enforcement officer, question anybody, it's like, ah, yeah, they're not telling the whole truth. Shocker, because you're a cop. Well, isn't that also any case ever in the history of the world? Like, yeah, there are people who know things who aren't talking because- yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like but, that's what happens yeah, because if somebody <laughs> murdered him, they're not going to be like, Oh yeah, I did it. Yeah. So it was actually the Washington County state attorney's office that led the inquest and that brought witnesses into court to testify under oath what they knew about Ralph's disappearance. The judge also issued several subpoenas for additional documentary evidence. And now inquests are rarely used in Vermont, apparently, But as Washington County State's Attorney Rory Thibault told VT Digger, quote, one benefit is that appearance can be compelled, whereas the lay person on the street can decline to be interviewed or speak with law enforcement, end quote. Yeah, that's all well and good. But, you know, swearing under oath, people still lie (laughs) under oath. Like, sure, you swear and say you're going to tell the truth in front of a judge or whatever. But like, I mean, if there's no evidence saying that you're lying, it's not like they're going to send you to jail. So if you lie. And you don't get caught. Then you lie under oath. Yeah. And you don't get caught. Mm -hmm. And it's not like compelling people to come to court is going to ultimately give you like 100% truth. People lie on the fucking stand all the time. So good as far as the effort goes, but I feel like that probably could have been sussed out by the local PD instead of now we're talking about the count, state, county, the state attorney, a state attorney, yeah, the county state attorneys. Yeah, office. yeah, right. I again, we don't know. It's oh a, no, no, it's no. a very new investigation. No, honey, we do know. So I'm getting okay. To that. Well, okay. you know, I don't. <laughs> yeah. So Thibault put on this big press conference surrounding this whole inquest. And straight up admitted that they were doing it because they were getting criticized for doing a crappy job investigating the case. So it was really a dog and pony show. Yeah, what the fuck? (laughs) So he like admitted to the fact that he was just doing it to appease the public? Yeah, he said that he was announcing this inquest due to, quote, significant public interest in the case and sentiments that either law enforcement or my office was not doing everything that was possible End quote. Maybe I'm altruistic in thinking this, but <laughs> the, if you if you're the DA's office, don't you think that you should investigate cases based on the fact that something criminal happened, as opposed to, oh, I'm getting pressure from citizens to do my job. Yeah. Am I missing something there? I mean, look, hey, you're... I mean, that's really cute that you still think uh, that, though. Okay. You're such a precious I'm, I'm not. I'm not... Okay, you're right. Sparkle child. I'm not an attorney, <laughs> but I am a cop. I'm just saying. No, and you're adorable. I'm just saying. You know what? I've been saying this in my entire career. What do I know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. What do I know? <laughs> All right, so Thibault went on to detail other efforts that have been made to locate Ralph, including conducting over a dozen interviews and several searches by foot and by drone. They also used a submersible vehicle from the Vermont State Police and did several searches of various bodies of water. So that's 
great, right? Like I was yeah, no, really that sounds fantastic. Yeah, I was really happy to hear that because apparently there was some sort of like pond that was near the motel. And so I think Did they that, do it or did they say that they <laughs> did it to appease the public? Because okay. apparently his his whoever this this DA his job only is contingent upon appeasing the public or what it seems like at this point. Oh, it gets worse later, but that oh, won't Jesus be until Christ. next week's episode. Okay. But yeah, I mean, let's assume that yes, they did do this. I don't think they just straight up like held a press conference and, and lied. I don't think there were bodies of water nearby, you know, like these are all things that had happened because regardless of whether it's a homicide or a suicide or anything, it could have been an accident. You said he was legally blind. Like maybe he he just fell into the fucking pond. Right. Or he got hit by a car or something like, yes, you need to look for a body. Right. Yeah. And then figure out what happened, but you got to look for a body. So that's great. Yay. Now the results of the inquest were kept private and they won't be released to the public in any way until the sure. case is solved. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So that makes sense. That's Everything's fine. fine there. Now this was September, 2020, but let's hop back in time a few months and talk about Bridget again. And this is how we're going to end this week's episode because there's a lot going on here, <laughs> but then there's a lot more <laughs> going on afterward. Um, so let's just talk about Bridget and then end for the week. So she had a busy spring after Ralph went missing. Remember Ralph, her boyfriend, who she sometimes refers to as her husband on social media, was last seen on April 13th, 2020. On April 27th, she updated her Facebook profile photo and relationship status to reflect that she was now dating a man named Chris Elmer. Chris Elmer. Do you remember that name? Was he not also one of the subjects in the car? No, not in the car. In the hotel room the night that Ralph disappeared. Mm. Okay. Oh, and then two days before that, before she like changed her relationship status, she tagged him in a Facebook comment on a group called I Don't Mess With Snitches. What? So like there is a group. Tagged him. Elmer. Elmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a, yeah, in a so like, photo saying in a, in in a, a group. group that says I don't mess with snitches. Yeah, that was the name of the group. And so she put like Chris Elmer tagged him and then like a laughing emoji. Okay. So, you know, that's just another thing that happened on Facebook. Was Ralph snitching on her for anything? No. That we know of? I think the inference that people are making is that she doesn't want Elmer to snitch on her or she's not gonna snitch on him. Oh. Okay. But again, it means nothing. It's all Facebook. Sure. Yeah, it's all Facebook. It's just a thing. But regardless, it doesn't appear that it was true love because on May 1st, Bridget updated her profile photo and relationship status once again to say that she was now with a new man, Thomas Partlow. And Partlow made his post about his new relationship public and soon a lot of comments started rolling in. Mm. Like this one from someone named Trina, quote, I thought she was with Elmo and Elmo is Elmer. Yeah. yeah. Also, where the fuck is Ralph? (laughs) End quote. (laughs) Okay. I'm sorry. Can can that just be like the hashtag for this episode? Because like (laughs) so far, like that's the best. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Where the fuck is Ralph? (laughs) And that one got 67 reactions. (laughs) Bridget hopped over onto the replies to tell her and everyone else asking about Ralph to back off, saying, quote, my personal life is exactly that, personal, so hop off, end quote. She went on to say, quote, I love how so many people are so interested and obsessed with my life these days. Must be these people's lives suck that badly that they have to spend their days on Facebook stalking others. Damn, it's kind of pathetic and sad, though. Feel bad for people like that. End quote. And then like a bunch of emojis. So showing so much remorse for the fact that the father of her allegedly three Uh children is missing. Yeah. And a woman named Morgan rightly commented underneath that quote, your profile is public. If you want your personal things kept to yourself, don't post it on Facebook. End quote. Which is really just a solid life tip in general for everyone. Yeah. I mean, you know, I would delete all of my social media accounts if it weren't for legitimately this podcast. 
Well, and our kids and our family, you know, we you, like to sit. I know, but you do enough updating <laughs> with my family. Like <laughs> my Facebook page could be completely gone and everything would be hunky dory. Like I don't care about social media at all. No, I, we're, I am, we're I am aware. so over it, you know, on so many levels. So like the fact that this person is just like, damn, everybody's concerned about my life. Nobody was asking about her life. <laughs> I think that's something that the, where the disconnect is. They were asking about Ralph. Yeah. Where's yeah. Ralph? <laughs> Am I missing something? No, no. Where, where's Ralph? Yeah. Right? Where is Ralph? Indeed. So then Partlow chimes in and starts threatening to kill people. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> saying that if they have an issue with him, they should set a time and place and quote, I bet your ass there would be a lot of concrete tarps in the swamps. End quote. All right. So let's document that. Mm -hmm. Once again, nobody was asking about him or saying anything about him. Maybe they were, but. No, I mean, not really that I saw. It sounds like everybody was asking, where's Ralph? So now we have two people that are saying, damn, my business is my business. And one person that's saying, if you come at me, I'm going to. There are tarps. Concrete tarps. I'm not exactly sure like what a concrete tarp would be, but it sounds sinister. Maybe like cinder blocks attached to tarps? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, he th he threatens to like kick a lot of people's asses too. And like there are a lot of threats that he makes in the comments of this. Just cool. real stable stuff. Cool. By mid-May, Bridget was back to posting about Ralph and how she wants him to come home. And I think, that, so it was like maybe everybody's yeah. comments started to get <laughs> oh, to her. So, so maybe she's realizing that on social media, she's not the most like, Yeah, like maybe it doesn't look person. great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so she like started posting like really long, like, oh my God, I can't live without you. I can't believe you're gone. I keep on hoping you're going to walk through the door. Da, 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 da. I think the, it, the point is really not so much that. It's more of like all of the just mess she was putting all over Facebook. So, yeah. and how she was just swinging from, I'm with this guy. Now I'm with this guy. Now he's yes. starting to kill people. Right. And now I'm loving my husband. She, that's when she started calling her husband, for husband. has never been her husband. Yeah. Right. And then like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, then after that, she started posting a bunch of like weird sex memes. What? I, I don't need, we don't even need to get into it. It's just like, I don't know. And then after that, like over the summer, after like the George Floyd protest started, she started posting a bunch of Black Lives Matter memes, which really rubbed people the wrong way, as you can imagine. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of like, hey, I know of a black life that matters. <laughs> Perhaps Ralph. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that didn't go over well. And it was just a whole hot mess express for quite a while. But by the end of the summer, all of the Facebook fun was about to come to an end. Just like this week's episode. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that? I didn't even write that. <laughs> just ad lib that, baby. <laughs> And before we end, though, I do want to take a minute and say this is one of those situations where, like, I really just want to scream. Like, I just want to scream about every aspect of this case that I've researched. And I know that we've been, like, you know, making jokes and stuff, but I'm making jokes about the ridiculous, like, people and situations sure, yeah. within this story. But I am dead serious about getting justice for Ralph and the fact that he deserves so much more than he's been given. You know, obviously I haven't done any research on this case, but just, just from what you're telling me, it just sounds absurd on right. so many levels. Yeah. Again, going back to, to, to the DA, the state DA getting involved. Yeah. Oh, and he shows up. Oh, he shows up next week. Trust like, me. Like, I mean, okay, so let's say for the sake of argument that that town goes exclusively to a, a state's attorney general or a state mm -hmm. district attorney. Yeah, because, state attorney general. Because that's just the jurisdiction or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like to just come out and say, yeah, we're 
we're releasing this information because the public pushed us to. What the fuck does that mean? What does that show about your investigation to start? Well, honey, and this may come as a shock to you, so gird your loins. But (sighs) as it turns out, a lot of people in law enforcement might have really fragile egos. (laughs) For those of you that can't see, I am beating my head against the microphone. (laughs) I just, I... There's like a whole separate podcast that we could do about the problems that I have with law enforcement today that we're not going to get into. No, but in terms of the fragile ego, like I'm not. No, I, I mean, it. I am joking, I, I, but no, honestly, you're not joking. No, I'm not because it really comes 100% into play. True. Yeah, it really comes into play next week, too. So in next week's episode, we're really kind of going to kind of move in to 2021. Like we're going to start. Um, at the end of the, the summer of 2020 with what happens with Bridget. And then we're going to kind of jump ahead to 2021 and where the investigation is now. And a lot of stuff happened last month in April because it was the one year anniversary of Ralph's disappearance. So there's a whole flurry of activity that just happened and is continuing to kind of happen because of that. Um, including that breaking news that, you know, I just mentioned that I was like researching hours before we sat down to record this. So there's a lot going on. And that's really where we're going to go next week. And if you thought that the county state's attorney was a little butthurt about the public's response in September of 2020, you should hear him in April of 2021. I have never understood why politics are involved in law enforcement. And again, that's a whole separate podcast, but the politics should not be involved in law enforcement. And they are across yeah. the board, 100%. Mm-hmm. Doesn't, doesn't matter whether you're appointed, doesn't matter whether you're an elected sheriff, politics are involved in every aspect. And it is completely absurd because you as a law enforcement officer should be there to protect the public. So if at the higher levels of investigations, there are issues going on, there should be public review boards, Mm -hmm. civil review boards, whatever you want to call them. I feel like you're going to make me delete half of this episode. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) I'm just going to shut up now. Please don't. Um, So yeah, so that's what we got for you for this week. Um, Like I said, we will be back next week to conclude as much as, I mean, I don't even think we will be concluding it because like I said, things are still happening every day. It's a very open investigation. It really is. So I think that right now it's going to be a two-parter, but again, like with some of our other cases, I do hope to bring more updates soon and hopefully positive ones, you know, hopefully updates that, that bring closure and, you know, can at least move the case forward. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, so we, that will be next week. Um, If you are in the $20 up, level of our Patreon, you will get access to part two uh, pretty much immediately. Like I will try my best to get them up simultaneously, <laughs> but you know, uh, I'll, I'll try. Like I was a little bit late with the, with the last one, but I was pretty close. Um, anyway, so you can do that if you're interested or you can wait till next week. So please join us back here for our, our next episode and help us get justice for Ralph. Share this Share the hashtag Justice for Ralph. We want to get his story out there as much as possible. Absolutely. Justice for Ralph. If you have any information about what happened to Ralph Jean Marie, please contact the Barry Police Department at 802 476 6613. You can also submit a tip anonymously to the Vermont State Police by texting keyword VTIPS to 274 637. That spells out crimes. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. 
And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for part two of Ralph Jean Marie. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production.